Thank you very much, Gail, and good evening, everybody. Um, it's a real privilege to be here, and I'd like to start with uh, thanking our hosts and organizers at GEFI for their hard work, not just in putting together this event in Glasgow at COP26, but also in the six months that led up to, the, uh, to bring the essay series to life. Uh, it's our pleasure at Royal London to have been involved in this work and to, um, to enable it to happen. And I want to pay tribute to our own uh, Casey Rayner, who's uh, a force of nature at Royal London and has been a driving force behind this project. Royal London is a major provider of pensions, and I suppose I'll start there. Um, with the rise of private pension provision, particularly through modern workplace pension schemes, our society has moved away from a model where governments and employers provide pensions uh, to a, a model where governments and employers have stepped back and the emphasis is on the individual instead, creating what we call a new invested, generations, invested generation. But many of these new investors feel ill-prepared to take on this responsibility. Our research tells us that customers are more interested in, than ever in the impact that their savings can have, but that they rely on us as the providers of their pension to make good decisions on their behalf. The UK has the fourth largest long-term savings market in the world and looks after about two trillion pounds worth of assets. The role of investors as the stewards of our customers' capital has never been more important. Now, within the, the long-term savings market in the UK, Royal London operates as a mutual insurer, owned by its customers and run for their benefit. This is actually relatively unusual today, as almost every other large UK mutual has demutualized and become shareholder-owned. Some of this was driven by a carpet-bagging trend in the 1990s, but for what, whatever reason, whilst most, most other major economies have protected their mutual sector, and upwards of 40% of insurance in Germany, US, and Japan is provided by mutuals, we've allowed the market share of mutuals in the UK to dwindle to below 10%. Royal London is now the largest mutual in our sector by some margin, and the only positive I take from the reduction in the number of mutuals is that it gives Royal London a unique competitive advantage in this market. It's with that context in mind over the next few minutes, I'll explore why we believe being a mutual makes it easier for us to do the right thing for our customers, what stewardship in the climate era means to Royal London, and why we must rethink our decision-making frameworks to incorporate the value we rely on from the natural world, some of the, the concepts that we talked about earlier. Okay, uh, unsurprisingly, my view is that mutuals are a natural way for people to organize their long-term savings because they allow people to pool risks together and to share the cost of investing. When managed well, mutuals are inherently more efficient than stock companies because there are no shareholders demanding dividends. If Adam Smith were here with us today, I think he would agree. And despite the image that he may have as the father of the free market and the champion of corporations, the truth is, and David um, mentioned this, he was less than complimentary in his critique of what is now the typical corporate structure. He believed that directors of such companies would not look after the interests of, share of stakeholders with what he called the same anxious vigilance with which people would watch over their own money. It's also reasonable, I think, to assume that he'd been, he would have been aghast at the way pe many people invest their hard-earned life savings passively into tracker funds, which just buy every company in the index, regardless of what its management is up to. What Smith referred to in this warning is what we've come to un understand as the agency problem, which we as a mutual believe we face to a lesser degree because we've no shareholders. In instead, we're run for and on behalf of our members. However, this agency problem is ever present in the companies in which we invest. So let me turn now to the need for robust stewardship by asset owners as we face the climate challenge. This is an area where the UK has taken a leading position in articulating the role for asset owners and asset managers through the FRC's stewardship code. This was revised in 2020 to reflect the belief that stewardship with a focus on the long term and a desire to deliver social as well as financial benefits is key to securing the best outcomes for our customers and for society at large. 
Uh, I would also commend the series of essays to you. Um, David did uh, earlier, but uh, they really are excellent. And in, in the review of, of book five, Dr. Zeti Aziz extends this concept beyond the current financial services definition of stewardship and proposes that the decades of negligence and plundering of the natural world confer an additional responsibility and accountability on the owners of capital to ensure the sustainability of our planet. She proposes a vision of a 21st century Adam Smith as a strong voice and advocate for the protection of the environment. This Adam Smith would call for urgent action from both the state and the market to deliver an outcome that would allow our progress and prosperity to be enjoyed by future generations. Now, David mentioned uh, a quote from uh, David Attenborough at the Guildhall, but for many of us watching the opening of COP26, David Attenborough's words also rang true when he talked about the potential for the globe's smartest species to be doomed by failing to see the bigger picture in pursuit of short-term goals. This is the essence of uh, stewardship in the climate era. We must, as stewards, challenge the companies we invest in to overcome their inherent focus on the short term, to think and act long term in a way that allows us to meet our current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. This is why we must rethink our decision-making frameworks to incorporate the value we derive and rely on from the natural world. The distinguished authors of the essay series have argued that nature determines the worth or the value of our future, and this is increasingly compromised. That the reductionist concept of a rational self-economic man, which has underpinned the theory of markets for the last 40 years, is insufficient as a tool to navigate the future. This is where the role of effective government and institutional interventions are key, which is what uh, the panelists were just saying. And that's highlighted by Sir Muscatelli in, in his revisit of book four of The Wealth of Nations. And in the Paris Agreement, it strikes me, we have the North Star to guide our action. The agreement made in 2015 goes further than a, an ambition to limit temperature increase and states an explicit objective to reorient finance to achieve sustainable outcomes and to do so in a just, fair and equitable way. The Sustainable De Development Goals have codified this into a set of objectives which align development with the objective of achieving outcomes which are not at the expense of future generations. And with the recent rulings on the inclusion of a sustainable future as an inalienable human right, we can see that we're beginning to move in the right direction, even if the pace, as we've noted, is sometimes a little bit problematic. But there is hope, I think, emerging from Glasgow with the progress made by the uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance on net zero and the announcements from the UK Treasury on the need to rewire the financial system. In these announcements, we see the recognition that we just talked about, that market forces alone can't tackle the problems that we're solving, or sorry, that we're facing, and an, accept, uh, and an acceptance that regulatory interventions are required to drive, uh, to drive financial flows into a Paris-aligned pathway and power an energy transition to realize our net zero ambitions. Now, as somebody noted, we have seen an energy transition in the UK before. The deindustrialization de of the UK and the closure of coal mines, for example, have left scars across our country that many communities continue to experience. At COP26, we've seen some great ambition to end the era of coal. But the way we do this is important. We must transition in a way that protects the most vulnerable whilst making changes that we need to protect the environment. To do this will mean we may need to move carefully and to spend more on developing new skills. This is important if we're to mobilize all sectors of society, retain the consensus that we have over climate change, avoid alienation that Jeremy spoke about, and ensure that the widening inequalities that we've seen emerge over the last 20 years are not exacerbated. And of course, it's not coal that we'll be, it's not just coal that we'll be phasing out, many other sectors will need to go through major upheaval, affecting jobs and creating a need for reskilling on a scale we've never seen before. Alongside this, we'll be asking people to change the way they live their lives, how they heat their homes, the cars they drive, and even their eating habits. Change on this scale requires a major overhaul of how companies interact with their customers and communities. This is why a focus on enabling a just, fair and equitable transition 
is at the heart of the Paris Agreement and is one of our priorities at Royal London. We believe that simply divesting from climate destructive assets is insufficient. Simply changing the ownership of the company will not change the company's activities. And ultimately, it won't have the impact of reducing real world emissions. That's why we're working with the Grantham Institute on climate change and our peers to create a financing a just transition alliance. The Alliance recently announced a new report outlining the elements that should be considered in the development of a just transition plan for companies. At Royal London, we're putting this into action through our engagement with companies in the utility sector. In the last 18 months, our work in collaboration with other members of the Alliance has secured just transition plans from five leading utilities companies, SSE, Eon, Centrica, EDF and Scottish Power. We'll continue our engagement with the utility sector and in 2022 we'll extend this to cover some of the largest emitters in the UK. Through engaging with the companies we invest in, living up to the, our responsibilities as stewards and using the rights we have to direct the companies we own through our voting, we believe active ownership and effective stewardship will enable real change with real world impact. At this point, I'd like to focus, actually, as Kizzy did in her work on the essays, on the theory of moral sentiments, which David mentioned earlier, which was Adam Smith's first book. For Smith, the theory of moral sentiments was his magnum opus and the wealth of nations as subsidiary. Quite why the wealth of nations has become so favored and, and the theory of moral sentiments neglected uh, is not entirely clear. But if the wealth of nations is to provide an explanation of wealth, markets, and the role of self-interest, it's the theory of moral sentiments which boldly asserts the role of empathy and articulates a fundamental principle which we appear to have overlooked, that for society to function fairly, the invisible hand must be guided by a moral compass. And it's in the theory of moral sentiments that Smith explores the way in which the excess of hubris and consumption can be tempered by the feelings of mutual obligation. He says, however selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though they derive nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. For the first time in decades, a serious mainstream debate has begun on the social purpose of the corporation. With organizations such as Business Roundtable, World Economic Forum, and even religious leaders challenging the power of multinational corporations and their profit maximization motive, which is, after all, putting at risk the habitability of the planet. And this is where Smith might contradict his more fervent 21st century free market followers. Where company intentions and actions are not aligned with the needs of society, he would argue for intervention to reassert the human nature of empathy for others into our corporate world. So what would our economic system look like if we were to amend, to amend the concept of rational economic man whose self-interest guides the free, uh, the free and invisible hand of the market? To one, wh where we prioritize the well-being of society rather than purely private profits. Act in the interests of the multitude recognizing that acting in good conscience is how we conceptualize the best versions of ourselves and provide direction to the undoubted efficiency of markets via a clear articulation of the moral purpose of finance and its role in society. I believe this is where there's an opportunity for a renaissance of the mutual model of corporate organizations alongside B corporations and cooperatives as a model which move beyond, moves beyond individualism and recognizes our inherent interdependence and reliance on each other. The recent pandemic has been obviously dramatic on so many levels, but in some senses, it has acted as a catalyst for change. As we enter a new normal, there's a real opportunity to reflect our changing needs and aspirations with a greater understanding of our interdependence, the need for fairness and equality in society, as well as the fragility of the natural world. Ultimately, as you know, it now falls to our generation. We are mutually responsible for determining the shape of the century to come. And the shape of the century depends a lot on this decade. We can no longer be passive bystanders, but active participants and influencers of change. And we have no time to lose.
Thank you very much.